Oh shit. When I played through the first two Dead Space games a couple of years back, I put off playing the third installment due to the amount of negativity it received at launch and the negativity it still receives today. I expected the third game to be a typical EA cash grab that exploited the once great franchise. You know, by chasing trends, completely changing it into something that it's not, and then pumping it so full of microtransactions that it barely resembles a video game. And yeah, while EA's influence is hard to ignore, I was blown away by how solid the third game is. It's big both in its level design and scope, it's beautiful for a 7th gen title, and it's easily the most comprehensive narrative game in the trilogy. Its development story is also a fascinating tale of a game studio's struggle against its publisher. Visceral Games RIP, wanted to create a fitting final chapter to the saga. Unfortunately, they were only able to do this if they made something that satisfied EA's sales expectations. What we got isn't the best game in the trilogy. It's a watered down, confused, and not particularly scary experience that in a lot of ways doesn't feel very Dead Space. But you know what? I still think it's pretty damn awesome. Dead Space 3's development is a tale of two games. There's the game that the studio behind it wanted to create, and the game that they were told they needed to make for it to happen at all. Ben Wannart, Dead Space 3's creative director, wanted the third game to return to the series' survival horror roots. The second game was much more action-oriented than the first, and rather than continuing down this path, he felt, along with many fans, that this new game should be the darkest in the trilogy. Unfortunately, Dead Space 2 sold less than EA had hoped for, and this meant that the third game came very close to being cancelled, the only way that it was able to survive was if it was modified to appeal to a large mainstream audience. EA's meddling is present in all of the Dead Space games, but in 3 it's the most severe. They demanded it focus on action rather than horror, because it was believed that this would appeal to players who might not otherwise be interested in this type of game. They specifically asked for there to be no psychosis or dementia themes, themes that had featured prominently in Dead Space 1 and 2. The original story was going to explore these in detail, and this had to be completely overhauled. This resulted in an experience that feels tonally different to the earlier titles. It also made the end product feel quite disjointed. Playing through it, it's obvious what parts came from the original vision and what parts were shoehorned in to make it attractive to the most amount of players. It was decided that multiplayer was a key way to bring in players, and it was included in the development process from the start. This time, the team wanted to tackle co-op rather than competitive multiplayer. They had actually experimented with this concept during the first game's development, but ultimately had to abandon it because it wasn't working within the confines of the single-player experience they had already built. Like with the first two games, Dead Space 3's marketing included supplementary content. As part of this, two graphic novels were produced. Dead Space Catalyst covers EarthGov's experiments with the marker, while Dead Space Liberation provides a backstory for the co-op character Carver. Like the previous graphic novels, both are supposed to be half-decent, although I haven't read them. The trailer was pretty tame compared to previous trailers, although it includes a live-action Gunner Wright, the voice actor for Isaac, which is a nice nod to fans of the series. It also uses the Phil Collins song, In the Air Tonight, which scores extra points in my book. It was released in North America on February 5th, 2013 to mostly positive reviews, although scores were lower than the previous installments. Most agreed that while it was a good game, the change to a more action-centric and less scary experience was the wrong direction. The game received plenty of backlash for the inclusion of microtransactions too, which again, most agreed undermined what was an otherwise decent game. Sales numbers are unclear because EA never made them public, although based on a comment made by then EA Labels President Frank Gibbu, Dead Space 3 needed to sell around 5 million copies for the series to survive. Given that Dead Space 4 never happened and that Visceral Games was shut down in 2017, it's clear that this target was never met. This is Whiskey 250. Serrano, do you read me? Tim! Oh, thank God! Did you find it? Find it. Doc, I'm not even sure what we're looking for. Get there! Follow the waypoint to thank you! I... I can't tell you anymore! Just get there! Don't... Do you hear me? You have to get there! What? Oh, it's lost! What? Dang it! This game has way more story than one or two. It's not just additional cutscenes, either. Everywhere you look, there's something to read or a voice recording to listen to. You're in constant communication with your team during gameplay as well. It's not quite uncharted levels of banter, but it's frequent enough to cut the tension. And this is one of the many reasons why it's less scary. Unfortunately, more story doesn't necessarily equal a better story. It's clear that they tried to cram in a lot and tie off as many loose ends as possible, and not all of it works. Exploring where the marker came from and its effects on humanity had a lot of potential, and although some of it is fascinating, the plot is lacking consistency. 
The main issue is that the supporting cast is incredibly unlikable, and you don't learn enough about them to give a shit when things go sideways. Some of the dialogue is really terrible too, and it takes itself so seriously that I found myself zoning out during cutscenes. There's a really cringy love triangle between Isaac, Ellie, and her new boyfriend Norton. They behave like angsty teenagers, bickering and feuding, and apart from potentially appealing to a tween audience, I honestly don't know why it was included. I should mention that I played the campaign solo. From what I understand, some parts of the story aren't explained very well if you play alone. For example, I get the sense that by the end of the campaign you're supposed to have built a bromance with Carver, but there isn't enough dialogue between the two for this to feel convincing. Thankfully, the environmental storytelling is on point, and the recordings you find do a much better job at fleshing out the world. You never really get the disturbing imagery or dark culty vibes that you got in the first two games. Well, you can if you pay for it, more on that later. But the origins of the marker are pretty fucking out there, and I dig it. So the story is a bit hit and miss. The additional lore about the markers is interesting, and I thought the story of the people in the research facility was genuinely compelling. The central story with Isaac, though, feels like an attempt at a B-grade horror film, without any of the campiness or self-awareness that makes those types of films fun. I don't want to say too much about the story in case I give something away, so let's move on. Like the earlier games, gameplay is comprised of three main pillars. Combat, resource management, and puzzles. And if you've played the earlier entries, this should be familiar. Combat has remained largely unchanged. Crowd control and chopping off limbs are still the focus, and many enemy types have returned with a few new tricks. These spider things, for example, are particularly freaky. Something that surprised me coming off the back of playing the Dead Space remake is how goddamn fast some of these enemies are. You're constantly being rushed down, and taking out legs is more important than ever. Having at least one weapon in your arsenal that can knock enemies back is essential, especially when fighting a horde of angry demon children. Generally, the flow of combat is satisfying, although some rooms feel poorly designed for a single player experience because enemies can come at you from every direction. I guess designing spaces that work for both solo and co-op would be difficult. Weapons are completely different now. Instead of a limited number of pre-built weapons, you predominantly assemble them from parts. You can find weapons hidden in the environment or you can craft weapons using resources. Weapons can also be modified with upgrade circuits that buff specific properties like damage and reload speeds. Some of the more powerful upgrade circuits buff multiple things too. For some reason, you can only carry two weapons at a time now, a change that removes the number of options you have for approaching each scenario. I think the weapon crafting system is a good idea, but the execution here feels off. For starters, there are so many options, both in terms of the weapons you can craft and the number of modifiers you can apply to them. Ironically, despite the huge number of things you can make, they don't look as unique as they did in the earlier games. I love the absurd size and reload animation of the contact beam, and visually there's nothing like that here. The number of options is overwhelming, and experimenting with different builds feels time-consuming and often unproductive. The further you get in the game, the easier it becomes just to stick with what you already have, because starting from scratch can often require a lot of resources. Also, I don't want to have to consult a wiki to find out what the best weapons are. There's some really powerful stuff you can create that fundamentally changes how difficult the game is, but unless you plan on multiple playthroughs, you'll probably never see most of them. I've left a link in the description to an article that contains some powerful builds, which I'd strongly recommend checking out if you plan on tackling the harder difficulties or New Game Plus. Now, as you know, normally I'd suggest playing these games on hard. I'm not going to do that here. If you want more of a survival horror experience than an action one, then sure, hard is the way to go. With this being more story focused and less scary than previous games, and hard being as fucking punishing as it is, I think you could play it on normal, or dare I say it, even casual and get a similar experience. Yeah, it's literally named after the audience they were hoping would buy it. On the lower difficulties, things like med packs and ammo are less critical, but on hard, I found that resource management played a much more significant role than any other game in the trilogy. Not only did I often find myself in situations where I didn't have enough space to carry everything, or was running out of stuff, I was constantly thinking about how to get the most out of the resources I had. Now, I like searching for resources in other games. I think it makes the crafting more satisfying. The amount of scavenging you need to do here, though, is bullshit. It feels like every area has a ton of stuff you need to pick up, and it rewards you with a tiny amount of resources. You can acquire these little scavenging bots to help you gather resources, but they feel redundant. So, on top of scouring every nook and cranny for items, now I have to babysit these bots too? I don't get why they're in the game. If resources simply rewarded you with more of each component, then you wouldn't need to do so much scavenging, or rely on these bots. And if the bots were more effective, couldn't you just rely on them instead of manually searching? In the end, you have to do both, which becomes tedious. 
Bots do find something called ration seals, which you can't find in the world. You convert these into resource packs at benches. These are the same packs that you can buy with real money, and oh yeah, they're RNG too, so they're essentially primitive loot boxes. Resource packs are so intrinsically linked to the monetization system that you need to be online to access the store to buy them, and this is even if you're using the ration seals. So when the stores for the older consoles inevitably disappear, this feature will no longer exist on those platforms. Bots can also be upgraded to be more efficient. The catch is that this can only be done with real money. Now, this is one hell of a paradox. You need scavenger bots to find resources and ration seals so that you don't need to spend real money on resource packs, but to get the most out of them, you need to spend real money. If this system sounds a little convoluted to you, then you're not alone. I didn't even realize that you could buy resource packs using ration seals in my first playthrough. It's not really Visceral's fault though. Apparently, the crafting system was already built when they were directed to add in microtransactions. On the positive side, the resource system is a much better diegetic mechanism than nodes. It's a much more plausible explanation of how Isaac can acquire items like health and ammo, as well as being able to upgrade his suit and weapons. So yeah, nodes are a thing of the past. There are still locked rooms full of goodies, although now you need to craft handles to access them. There's no store either. Ignoring ration seals, resources of the game's sole economy. Another casualty of the microtransactions was weapon-specific ammo. Every weapon uses the same ammo now. This was apparently changed late in the game's development, and removing this strategic staple makes the combat feel, you guessed it, less strategic. Upgrading the suit remains pretty similar to the other games, except that there are more branches. Mission design is similar to the previous games, with Isaac needing to complete various tasks to bring systems back online and generally get things working again. A number of chapters have side quests too. All of them give you a bit more world building, with some going deeper into this than others, and some giving you a real sense of exploration. The extra missions in the second half of the game offer some of the game's hardest challenges too, being brutal gauntlets that will test your combat skills. These missions always pay out in good loot, so completing them isn't just for bragging rights. Some of them reuse the same areas over and over, which is a bit disappointing, but I definitely recommend not skipping them, because you'll miss out on some interesting lore and locations. What I wish you could skip are the horrible sections where you either have to repel or climb a cliff face. These sections usually involve dodging environmental hazards while trying to take out enemies. They just feel so far removed from what I enjoy about Dead Space. There are other sections that are action heavy too, but they're generally brief and I didn't mind the occasional change in pace. In general though, having these bombastic action set piece moments feels like an odd juxtaposition against the slow and dark corridors the series is known for. If you play the game co-op, there are a number of missions that are exclusive. Thankfully they aren't essential, so if you're a sad fucker like me who doesn't have anyone to play with, don't stress, you're not missing out on a large chunk of the game. Although most environments and some of the puzzles were designed with two players in mind, I think the story is best served as a solo experience. They do some interesting things with co-op, like player 2 seeing things that player 1 can't, so I'm not saying don't play it this way. I just think that Dead Space is at its best when it's scary, and if you party up, it's going to be less scary. Another big change which I don't like is the removal of save stations. I know that they don't make a lot of sense in the universe, but I like the strategy and stress that comes with manual saving. The save system here isn't great either. Most of the time it starts you close to where you saved, or close to a workbench. Occasionally though, it puts you way back from where you are up to, and you have to replay a large chunk of the chapter. Okay, how about puzzles? The number and quality of puzzles compared to the earlier games is lower, and environmental puzzles are far less grand. I like what's here, but there's no denying that most of them feel like minigames baked into the environment, rather than puzzles that utilize the environment. Unfortunately, the large puzzles suffer the most, lacking the challenge and creativity found in the first two games. Late in the game you get superkinesis powers, which are used for solving a couple of room-sized problems, although they're not very memorable. Superkinesis can be used to inflict crazy damage on necros though, so there's that. Overall, while it's the least consistent from a quality, tone and gameplay perspective, it's easily the meatiest, and I'm not just talking about chunks of meat either, I mean in terms of scale. This is a big game. My first playthrough clocked in at over 18 hours, and I missed a bunch of side quests, didn't read half the logs, or come close to finding every hidden item. Once you finish the game, you unlock a bunch of stuff. As usual, there's New Game Plus that lets you start a new game with all your shit from your first playthrough, including those ration seals you didn't realize existed. There are new suits and things like the foam finger to unlock as well. New Game Plus feels very different here. You know how I said the weapon system felt redundant and that it was a hard game? That all changes in New Game Plus. Starting with tons of resources and loads of powerful upgrade circuits, the weapons that you can create become horribly overpowered. 
This isn't necessarily a bad thing, this is part of the appeal of New Game Plus in the earlier games. It's just that here, things get really nuts. It's not a power fantasy anymore, this is straight up god mode. In addition to New Game Plus, there are a couple of other modes to unlock as well. Classic plays more like the first two games. Co-op is turned off and you don't craft weapons from parts, you essentially buy them using resources. The weapons blueprint list is different too, it only has classic weapons. They don't look like they did in the older games, but they perform in a similar way. Classic also bumps up the difficulty. The best part is that you can use the engineering suit that you unlock after beating the campaign. Ah, that's better. Pure survival mode is an alternative New Game Plus mode. This is a bit more extreme than a standard New Game Plus. It removes weapon parts and upgrade circuits, and oh yeah, enemies no longer drop stuff. You'll need to craft everything at benches, so finding resources is even more important. If that sounds like a cakewalk, then fuck you, how about hardcore mode? This is similar to the hardcore mode in Dead Space 2, but even more extreme. This is a permadeath mode that will delete your save file when you die. Enemies are set to the highest difficulty, although they do frequently drop health and ammo. If you're going to attempt this, there's an exploit that I'd highly recommend. You can save a copy of your progress to an external USB drive, so that if you die, you can recover your last save. If you're a crazy person and somehow beat hardcore mode, you unlock retro mode. This isn't actually a game mode, it's a visual setting that changes the colours and makes the game look a bit pixelated. And no, I'm not a crazy person. The fuck you doing, man? Carver. What are you doing in my apartment? The DLC is called Awakening and is set after the conclusion of the main campaign, so if you don't want spoilers, you'll need to skip ahead to the next chapter. Okay, so at the end of the credits you hear Isaac saying Ellie's name. Awakening picks up directly after this, and I guess you could view this DLC as the game's true ending. I say you could because it retcons the original ending, and I'm not convinced this is better. It's incredibly short, taking about one and a half to two hours to complete. It reuses a lot of environments from the main campaign, and while it does dress them up differently, there's not a lot to see here that you haven't before. The writing is somehow worse here too. Man, I don't even know what dead means anymore. Are we Necromorphs? Is this what they feel like after the, after the marker reanimates them? Could you be any more crazy? Hell no, we are not Necromorphs. I think they're taking the piss now because this is actually funny. In its defense, it's a lot more like the first two games in tone. There's lots more psychological stuff going on, and it's much more disturbing. There are a couple of different enemy types here, but nothing that's going to blow your mind. This feels more like the game that they originally wanted to make. It just doesn't have enough new stuff as far as environments and gameplay is concerned. $10 also feels like a premium price for something that's this brief. I don't know, if you're gagging for more, then maybe give this a go. Otherwise, I think the conclusion of the main campaign is more satisfying when left as it is. This is the best looking game in the original trilogy from a technical standpoint. It's not the same leap in fidelity that 2 made over 1, but there are a number of visual improvements. For example, this is the first game to use any kind of anti-aliasing, and I think overall the progress that Visceral made between the first game and this is staggering. Let's start with environmental design. Dead Space 3 has the most diverse environments in the trilogy. Dead Space 2 was a huge improvement over the brown corridors in the original, but 3 outdoes them both. You've got ships, cities, snow, space, the ruins of a 200 year old research facility, and another location which I won't spoil. Environments are generally much larger too. You still get plenty of spooky corridors, but the number of open areas has increased dramatically. Thankfully this hasn't resulted in less detail. Each location is chockers full of environmental storytelling and things to investigate. Visiting older locations was an awesome idea. I have an unhealthy obsession with ruins and derelict buildings, and some of the locations here are exceptionally well designed and extremely creepy. The snowy environments in the second half of the game are a real highlight. It's very alien meets the thing. Enemy design largely follows the templates set by the earlier games, although they've been redesigned. Just like with the earlier games, their design is based on real life sources, and this time it was the frozen mummies from Lost Polar Expedition, such as the Franklin Expedition. Like I said earlier, Dead Space 3 isn't that scary, so I recommend looking up the photos of the real mummies and I guarantee you won't sleep for a week. I've left some links in the description for you. You're welcome. The lighting is great too. 
I don't think anything comes close to the art direction of the first game, but the way dynamic lighting has been used here, like how the light from Isaac's visor reflects off surfaces, is impressive for a game of this vintage. It's a shame that the game isn't darker, because it would have been incredible if you had to navigate some sections using the light from his visor alone, but maybe this was another EA cut. One area that hasn't stood the test of time is NPCs. The NPCs in the earlier games look heaps better than these. I don't know what happened here. Isaac looks okay, but the rest of the cast looks like rejects from a Fantastic Four movie. Were they added in at the last minute, or did character design get given to an intern? Facial animations are pretty good in spite of what they're working with, but yeah, dang. The audio design on the other hand is outstanding. The surround mix is brilliant and best experienced with a decent headphone, headset or surround system. Unlike Dead Space 1 and 2 where music was used sparingly, music is used constantly throughout the game. The score isn't as eerie as the previous installments, there's definitely more of a Michael Bayness to it and this makes the game feel very different tonally. In the sections where it does get all dark and spooky and use the traditional Graves score, you get a taste of the game that the developers were trying to make, especially in the last couple of chapters. Although this is the most visually impressive game, at least from a technical point of view, I did come across a few issues. In one section, the frame rate tanked into what felt like single digits, and occasionally enemies would breakdance on geometry. These problems were rare, although I've never encountered issues like this in the first two games. Much like Dead Space 2, the third game looks and plays almost exactly the same across the PS3 and 360. The PC unquestionably looks and plays the best, but the older console versions still hold up well. This was a late game for that console generation, and it's the third game in the series. It's clear that Visceral really understood their way around those machines by that point. The console versions run at a typical 30 frames per second at a 720p resolution, and apart from the one section where it tanked for me, the frame rate is basically locked at 30 frames per second. The PS3 once again gets superior audio supporting 7.1 LPM compared to the Dolby Digital Surround on the 360. The PC can, unsurprisingly, achieve much higher resolutions and an uncapped frame rate if you disable VSync. There's also a ton of mods for it, and someone even went as far as making a Redux version that, amongst other graphical improvements, includes ray tracing. This is also one of the backwards compatible games on the Xbox Series systems that can take advantage of the FPS boost. I played the Xbox 360 version, and although I find that 30 frames per second is becoming increasingly harder to go back to, the console version is still very playable and cheap. I picked up a copy in excellent condition for just $10 Australian. At the end of the day, while some versions look better and run at higher frame rates, every port of this game is still very playable in 2023. Visceral tried a lot of new things here, and while not everything works, and EA's desire for a mega hit compromised the final product, it's still a mostly excellent game. It has the biggest campaign in the trilogy, and that's before you consider that you can play the entire thing in co-op. There's heaps of replay value too, with loads of stuff to unlock, including new ways to play it, and in spite of it being more linear than the previous entries, the sheer number of side quests, weapons you can craft, and collectibles demands a new game plus. It's a shame that it's not that scary, particularly because it had the potential to be the most terrifying game in the trilogy. The Dead Space games are at their best when you're alone in the dark, wondering if you have enough resources to make it to the next save station, and Dead Space 3 doesn't really have that. It's not the strongest game in the original trilogy, but it's not a bad game. In fact, I think it's a pretty damn good one, and if you enjoyed Dead Space 1 and 2, I can't see why you wouldn't find something to like about this.